Here's the second one. Uh, turn back to where you did your starter questions this morning, right? The very first thing. I, uh, I introduced these four seemingly random complex numbers to you, and I named them as well. I called them Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and then Z5, which happened to be the same as Z1. Using our language of real and imaginary components we can separate out, I wonder if you can just do a little exercise with me for each of, and maybe you want to draw this little table for yourself too, for each of the numbers, and I'm going to leave Z5 off of this list because it's clearly the same as the top row. For each of these numbers, what's the real part? What's the imaginary part? Start me off. Z1. Real component is? Five. Five. Imaginary component is? Two. two. Next one. Z2. Negative. Negative two. And positive five. Yeah? Uh, next one down. Negative five. Negative two. Last one here. Uh, two. And negative five. You okay with that? And I want you to stare really hard. I'm inviting you to kind of be like Brown, like that botanist who was staring down his microscope and he was like, what's going on here? Is there something more than what I can see? Is there something invisible underneath this that's driving this process? These are not just random numbers, right? What do you notice? What do you wonder when you have a look at these? Does anyone notice any patterns? What do you see? What do you think? Start us off. Yeah, that will, um Huh. Okay, so real part of this one, imaginary part of this one. Real part, imaginary part. Real part, imaginary part. And you could extend it all the way around, right? Here comes the real part and then the imaginary part. Good. So we're noticing there's this relationship. Is there anything else that you notice? Every two cycles, it multiplies by minus one. Every two cycles, let me say that again, Angad. Every two cycles of multiplying by i, you're essentially multiplying by minus 1. That makes sense because each time we progress, we're multiplying by i. So if you do it twice, you're multiplying by i squared. So if you have a look at these two, yeah, you see the flipping of signs? If you look at these two, flipping of signs. Uh, and you can do it with any, like, as long as your gap is 2, right? Hmm. Now, the last thing I want you to notice is I called these numbers something specific, right? I called them z1, z2. There's the first number, the second number, the third, and then the fourth. If you were to imagine, because they aren't, but if they were, if you were to imagine these guys as coordinates, like it's a pair of numbers each time, coordinates on like a Cartesian plane, where would these numbers go? And what relationship would there be between them? Humor me. Draw me a Cartesian plane, just underneath where you got this, right? <laughs> And for the sake of the conclusion we're about to draw, right? Get some decent scale on this. If you have a grid book, then you're at an advantage. I don't. Um, and in the HSC, you won't. So I'm going to draw some um, quick little indicators for me of scale here. And because of the numbers we've got, you're going to have to go up to five everywhere. So go ahead and put that so you've got something consistent. And uh, a ruler would be enormously helpful for this, right? I mean, one of the cheating things is it's actually a lot easier to draw accurate diagrams on a whiteboard because they're huge. Uh, when they're, you're doing it small, uh, you really should. If you want a straight line, use a ruler. So you can see I've got you know, values on my scale up to five in, in all directions. So, so where would this number here, five comma two, where would that be? The first number, it's going to be five comma two. It's, it's going to be there. Is that okay? Call that five comma two. First number over here. Where's the second number? Negative two five. That's going to be point to it. Where's it going to be? It's going to be it's going to be up here, right? So I'm going to go negative two comma five. So about there, ish. Negative two comma five, right? Uh, and then I'm just going to keep going around, right? This first number is over here. Second number is over here. Third number. Third number is. Down here, isn't it? Negative 5, negative 2. Some over here. Negative 5, negative 2. And then finally, 2 comma negative 5 will be here. Now, isn't that strange that the first number, it's in the first quadrant. I just defined that for you. But if the first number is in the first quadrant, then the second number ends up in the second quadrant. And the third number is in the 
third quadrant, and the fourth number is in the fourth quadrant. Put one more thing onto your diagram just to help me out, right? From the origin here, if you imagine a line extending upwards, right, to my point over here, and then another line, or an interval I should say, that goes from the origin to my next point, and then another line over here, another interval, another interval, right? Can you see, and remember the Z5, the Z5 I asked you to calculate, it ends up back over here, right? Ends up at 5, 2. What is the operation that takes you from through these numbers, the answer is I'm multiplying by i. But now if you think of this not as an arithmetic problem, but as a geometric problem, what operation gets you from the first number to the second? It's rotating 90 degrees. I, I'm rotating 90 degrees, or pi on 2 radians, right? And then what? Yeah. Anti I'm going anti-clockwise as well, because I started here and I ended up in the second quadrant. And then I do it again, because I'm still multiplying by i. I, I rotate again. And then I rotate again. If you ever wondered why, when we do compass bearings, right, we say start from true north and then go clockwise, right? But then for some reason, when we moved into the Cartesian plane, we then said, actually, we want you to go anti-clockwise. Don't worry about why. Just, we just want to mess with you and make things as hard and arbitrary as possible. Why are we going the opposite direction? The answer is, because of this, multiplication by i, it's rotating you around. Do you remember when we had a look at those water molecules, right? The problem, the reason why they were invisible is because they were too small. Do you remember that? They were too small. Why could we never find, why were these complex numbers invisible to us? Well, if you want to think about the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? You can imagine sort of progressing along. Then we add the rational numbers, you sort of fill in the gaps, right? All of those numbers are filled in between them. Then when we said we add the integers, we could say you can go off, you know, if that's zero, you can go off in the, uh, the other direction as well. And this is what we call the number line, right? But these complex numbers that we are searching for, they're not anywhere on this number line. They're actually on a number plane. Numbers are not one dimensional. They can actually exist in two dimensions. What you've drawn here, you might have noticed I very artfully did not actually label any of my axes. This is not the Cartesian plane that you're familiar with. This is actually what we call the complex plane. And in fact, rather than put these coordinates here, right, this is not a pair of real numbers. This is actually just a single complex number. What that I does, what that imaginary unit does, is it lifts you off the number line or pushes you down off of the number line to a place that we didn't consider that numbers could be. They were invisible because we never imagined that there could be things off of this line. And so the complex plane is what we are going to explore. What, what have I got here? In the negative 2 plus 5i is what we're going to explore in the coming weeks. We have a whole new universe to wade into. I hope you're excited to discover what awaits you.